Freedom. This weekend is uh, a day or a weekend that's often portrayed with freedom. Today, especially in this world, this word is looked at very differently. It comes with the association, well, freedom. I'm free to do whatever I want. Oh, I like freedom. Think of even one of the main reasons people came to the new world was freedom of religion. Not to get away from religion, but to be able to follow God the way they were seen. That importance that was there. Freedom is looked at a lot differently in today's day and age as we see how words change through time. But as we know and we heard through the sermonette, the reminder God's word doesn't change. Turn over to John chapter 8. <clears throat> we see some familiar verses that Christ reminds us of. And keep getting back to this idea of these two sides that are emphasized over and over through Scripture. John chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 30. John 8 and verse 30. As he, talking of Jesus Christ, spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This free, free, free to do what you want. Follow God's ways. Think of how important this is. In this reminder, verse 32 is often quoted as a memory scripture. Not free to sin, free from sin from that way of life and free to live a different way of life. I think as we've looked at the two choices that continue throughout the Bible, as we've kind of gone through this theme through the past few sermons, God sets before us life and death. Deuteronomy 30, he sets before us the give way of life, the get way of life. Events before us, will you defend the truth or will you deny the truth? Will you fulfill God's word or will you destroy? Looked at last week, many say Christ was f destroying God's law, which was couldn't be further from the truth. We see these two ways continually come up through Scripture. Today we're going to look at a section of Scripture that Christ emphasizes these two choices. Sermon title for today is Narrow or Wide? Narrow or Wide? No, I'm not referring to your width shoes. Width. Yeah, wide shoes, narrow shoes. Uh, we have something else. If you turn over to Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> Luke chapter 13. A section we all often think of in the Sermon on the Mount, and we will get to that portion that sums this section up in two verses. There's a lot more that we see here in Luke 13. We'll begin in verse 22. Luke 13, verse 22. Luke 13, verse 22, And he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying through, journey, journeying toward Jerusalem. He's on his way, and he's teaching God's word, teaching what they should understand. And here comes a question, verse 23, a legitimate one, wasn't trying to trick him up. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? Are there few? Be the, the opposite of the world, that, you know, there's so many being saved. We have to hurry up and start saving more. We've got to make sure they say Christ's name and they'll be saved. And we'll make sure they don't burn in hell for all eternity. This question, saved, are few being saved? This word for saved can also be translated deliver. Word meaning gives it the meaning of involves the preservation of life either physical or spiritual. Think of more important, spiritual, to die for what, we live, what God's Word shows. Turn over to Luke chapter 17. Keep a bookmark here. Back and forth as we think of this question posed. There are few who are saved. Same word appears here in chapter 17, verse 33. 17, verse 33, whoever seeks to save his life 
will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Think of this importance. Do we seek to just save our physical life? This past year, it's been an important question. Is it just something our physical life is the most important? We continue to follow God no matter what. This word saved is the same one that we saw in the previous section in chapter 13. In this reminder, baptism, only give your life God's ways or willing to give it. Be willing to lose it to actually gain it, to preserve it, and to see what that future holds. You don't have to turn there. We went there a few weeks ago. Revelation 12 and verse 11 refers to the saints overcoming Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. We see this priority of life is the spiritual over the physical. An importance of, all right, if we have to give our physical life, it's more important. Physical life or the spiritual? How much more important that spiritual life in God's family for all eternity, that choice still has to be made. We see back in Luke chapter 13 <clears> that this original question gets asked, and in some regards you may think, well, this seems a little bit off topic. See, he doesn't give a yes, no answer here. Then he gets into something deeper. Are there few who are saved? Verse 23, and he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Verse 24 flies against everything in this world's Worldly Christianity that, oh, all you got to do is say Christ and you're good to go. You're saved. You're, you don't have to worry about anything else. Yet Christ says, and he will seek to enter and will not be able to. He begins this verse in verse 24 with a, a powerful word. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. This word strive is a strong word in the Greek. It's strong it's number 75. Agonizmo, which it sounds a lot like where we get our word agonize, thing we put effort into. You agonize over this to work at, to force yourself to work at this. We think of this importance to strive. The Greek means to contend for victory, to fight for. Again, also be translated fight, wrestle. Thing we're to put energy into. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And these quick words, strive to enter, gets kind of glossed over quickly. But how much emphasis is on this strive? How much effort is involved? 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. This word, first word for fight is the same Greek word we're looking at for strive. Strive for the good fight. Fight. Same word, fight. The good fight of faith. Lay hold on your physical life. Your verse says either. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This emphasis to fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life. We're ultimately longing for that seventh trump. And this reminder to strive, fight for it with all your being. It's not just, oh, just say Christ's name a few times and you're good to go. It's something we are continually to be working at. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul uses this word several times. One of them here. Looked at one of them. First Timothy. Look at another one here. First Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. First Corinthians 9. In verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? 
Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. This word competes is the same word that we've been looking at, strive. Everyone who strives, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, exercises self-control in all things. Talking on the physical level, what he's mentioning, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul was not above this in his life. Well, let me give you the sermon, but I don't need to work on this. Like, I've got to work on it too. All of us are continuing in this run as we look to Jesus Christ as that first of the first fruit, one who ran it perfectly. And this striving that, again, is part of that race, part of what we're doing in our life. Turn over to John 18, one other place we'll look at where this word strive is used. This one always hits me because you think of how different this will be at Jesus Christ's second coming. John chapter 18, in verse 36, it goes along with what we heard in the sermonette. We think of all the things in this world. We get caught up in the politics. We say what Christ says, something that we really believe. Christ in verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. This word fight, my servants would fight, same word for strive in the Greek. Here we see and are reminded the second coming of Jesus Christ will be different. Here he reminds them, it's my time to die. Oh, the things that I have to go through, my kingdom is not of this world. All the men and women of faith understood in Hebrews 11, and that reminder to us, our kingdom is not of this world. Yes, we live in a blessed nation at this point. We see it quickly falling apart, which is sad to see. Again, it comes from not following God's ways. What we are to be striving for is a kingdom to come. Remember Matthew 6, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This word strive has a lot to it. Turn back to Luke chapter 13. Where he begins this answer. With strive, strive to enter through the narrow gate. This word narrow, the King James, if you have it, is translated straight, the straight gate. This Greek word simply means straight or narrow. It's simply translated this narrow or straight, it only occurs three times. Of them we'll see in Matthew's account in two verses. But this simple this straight and narrow, this narrow gate. This word for gate can also be translated door. Not as think of as a door here into a building. Think of this massive gate, this massive door, this entrance to a city, a major thoroughfare. Enter through the narrow gate. You think of strive to enter through the narrow gate. Why is this something we are to be working at so diligently. And he says, For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Many will seek it. Not few will seek it. Many will seek it. See, the vast majority of the world wanting it to some regard, but well, you know, do I have to follow exactly everything God's ways? No, I don't want to follow everything. We think of this word many that occurs. Turn over to Matthew chapter 24. The same word that occurs here. 
several times, five or six times within about a handful of verses, that talks of a lot of end-time events, things that will take place. Christ emphasizes many will seek this narrow gate. They won't find it. We see the vast majority that again seek another way. Matthew 24 and verse 5. There's twice here, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. January, February, we went through nominal Christianity, not to point fingers, but are we following Jesus Christ the way God's word chose? Many will say, well, this is my Christ, and oh, you keep an Easter, Christmas, keeping part of the Sabbath holy, you go down the list of, well, which way do we go? And yet, how did Jesus Christ live? Be following him. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Again, the emphasis on majority. Most. See, dropping down to verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Looked at last week in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not just enough not to kill someone, not even to let those emotions build up. And I'm going to just hate them, but I'm not going to kill them. What's well, where it starts to begin in your mind? It starts to develop this hatred that should never be there. And this offense that occurs to many. Verse 11 Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We think of many occurs so many times. Many occurs many times. Many, many. We think of how much of this majority. Well, no, the vast majority are going to believe Christ. Christ said, many will seek to enter the narrow gate. They won't find it. Won't be let in. See back to Matthew, or Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> he starts to give the example, a very simple statement that he gives in verse 24. For many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able. They'll seek it, but they want it on their own terms. Well, I don't want to have to follow all God's laws. How, how about just some? I want to partially follow, but I'm a Christian. We follow with our whole heart, mind, and soul. Verse 25, he goes through the example. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. Very similar to the ten foolish virgins. The door has been closed, and they're knocking. Why has it been closed to us? We see the knocking of the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where you are from. Doesn't even know where they're from. Who are you? He doesn't, oh, I used to remember you way back when. I used to, I don't even know you. Then you will begin to say, verse 26, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. We were close. We were somewhat close. You taught. We were in the streets. We weren't really wanting to get too close. We didn't want to follow every word of God. But we wanted to get close. We at least know how to answer the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. Yet, he didn't know them. Verse 27 <clears throat> But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. You think of the world, even in Christianity, even sometimes in the church. Well, well come on in. Let me teach you your, the truth. Let me show you. We can make things right now. Isn't the reply. I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from. Depart from me. All you workers of iniquity. The emphasis here is they're not looking to repent. Good enough the way we are. Just let us in. We're happy to party with you. But we don't want to actually do what you want us to do. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. 
It's where it is also translated, you workers of lawlessness. You think you can say Christ's name, but you don't need to follow God's laws. Something huge missing in a relationship. This narrow way as it's described, this narrow gate, many will seek it, but not on God's terms. Oh, we think this is the way we should follow God. We think we should do it this way. It keeps coming back to those two columns as you think of God setting before us life and death. Here we see the narrow way, the way that many will go the other way. We see in verse 25 through verse, uh, through verse 27 here, this depart, this be removed. Verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are, they, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. You see this reference, whether this specifically is referring to the third resurrection in verse 28, seems to point to there still being a chance to repent. First being last, the last being first, the Jews having God's truth first. But they kept going back to, we have, we're of Abraham's seed. Why do we need a Savior? We're good. We're good to go. And them being last, being thrust out because there's no seeking repentance of, and wrong, Rep forgive us, help us to turn to your ways. Instead, we see a different mindset that's there. We see an attitude that is against God's ways. One of lawlessness going against God's truth. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> where we see in the Sermon on the Mount, these two verses, and Luke's account follows after this. It's something again Christ emphasizes over and over, it emphasizes it after, it brings out more details in it in Luke's account. And yet here in Matthew, we see two simple verses with a lot of meat in it as well, but also around the same section. So much of that reminder, being aware of false prophets, what we've already looked at in Luke's account. Uh, being careful, false prophets will come and deceive many. You looked at in Matthew 24. And what sounds very similar, verse 21 through 23, where they're going to knock. They want to know. We enter. Then we do all these wonderful things, prophesying, casting out demons, doing many wonders. The same reply, I never knew you. Verse 23, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're not trying to overcome. You're not trying to repent. You're practicing lawlessness. Instead of doing the will of the Father in heaven, lawfulness. What we're to be living what we're putting into practice, why he covers that in verse 13 and 14, that we see this principle. Enter by the narrow gate, or wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because, other translations have how, how narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few find it. These two ways that are shown here, these, these two gates as we see, has a lot in it. Here we see in verse 13 the same word for narrow that we saw in Luke's account. But we also see wide. Wide is the way, this other way that's listed. Word wide is also translated broad. It's wide way. There's actual a gate. We see a gate mentioned here, but wide open is it just come as you are, whatever you like, come on in, go this way. We see in verse 14, this narrow way is described as difficult. I think, well, wait a second, it's difficult. Haven't we seen the, the the oxen being 
uh, yoked to Jesus Christ, and it's an easy way. It's Christ trying to remind us here, this difficult is the way which leads to life. Think of eternal life, what Christ is reminding. This word for difficult here is New King James. In the King James, it's translated narrow. It means to press together, to compress, afflict. Affliction that is done through this path. Think of not the normal, not what the majority are doing. It's not popular. Think of this reminder here and what we're to be living. And over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3. Put a bookmark if you haven't already left Matthew, sorry. Hebrews, or sorry, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. This section we looked at some of last week. This precedes this section and this reminder of evil men and posters will grow worse and worse. Where God's truth is where we lean on, what we look to always in our life, and what we heard in the sermonette. But this reminder here, verse 12, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly. All those seeking the narrow path. Think of this way being referenced as difficult or narrow because it isn't popular. There will be persecution. There will be those afflicted. Verse 11, you can put in your notes, verse 37. With, towards the end of that chapter, we see the men and women of faith and the listing of them being killed, afflicted for the truth. The word afflicted is the same one here for narrow in God's ways and being afflicted for it. Not because God's ways are difficult and we can't possibly do them, but because I'd rather go with the flow. I'd rather be popular and not be looked down upon by friends or family. I don't want to go against the rough majority. You think of Matthew 7 and verse 13, 13 through 40. There's a good commentary. It's a, a book that goes through this section. It's, it's decent. I, sometimes I'll recommend books. Um, this one is the message of the Sermon on the Mount by John R.W. Stott. John R.W. Stott, The Message of the Sermon on the Mount. Again, gives, gives good background, but misses the big picture at times. Here's one. It gives great background on Matthew 7 and the narrow way versus the wide. It gives great parallels. And yet John Stott keeps Christmas, Easter. Which path is he on? Where's the living God's ways? All of them. It's interesting when you look at verses 13 through 14 of, of Matthew 7, you get four sets of twos. I'm going to briefly go through these. These four sets of twos here that we see in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. So we've seen each of these already to some extent. We see clearly there are two ways. In the very first of these, there are two ways. There's the hard way, quote unquote. The difficult, narrow path. And then there's the easy, quote unquote. Part of it, it's not really easy when you look at all the curses that take place down that path. But it's called, quote unquote, easy, the broad, the spacious, the roomy path that you can go down. These two ways. We look at this narrow way that's talked of here and the wide way. We think of the narrow, talks of boundaries are clearly marked. Yet we see the other, wide and easy, quote unquote, because hey, there's no boundaries, they can walk wherever you want. Well, you fall off a cliff. Well, you know, you can walk wherever you like. You still suffer the consequences. The narrow way restricts pilgrims to the confines of what God has revealed in Scripture to be true and good. Here's what God's ways are and how 
blessed they are. Here's what we want to live. The other way, we see plenty of room on it for diversity of opinions and laxity of morals. The road of tolerance and permissiveness. No curbs, no boundaries of either thought or conduct. Follow your own inclinations. Think of, again, the narrow way. God's holy, righteous, and perfect laws that show how to live, how to truly love God and love mankind. So different from the wide path. We see with God's ways of the narrow, the belief. I believe. I believe God's word. You see the wide path, I believe, turns into I feel. Uh, I feel that doesn't really apply to me. I feel nothing is to be obeyed or believed. Well, you shouldn't kill me, but everything else is kind of game. You, whatever works best for you. You think of this reminder in our life, over to Matthew chapter 11, because this narrow gate, often translated, again, difficult or straight, because it's going against the majority, still reminds us what it's like. It's Christ's words. We looked at it, I think, back in November, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Matthew 11, verse 28 Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Heavy laden, heavy stressed. Think about being in the world, how it feels. Oh, stressed out. Then I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ reminding us when we're going on the path, we're not struggling as we looked at that yoke, and you're not pulling. Christ's like, you can do it. Keep at it. We can do this. He pulls alongside, helping. That first, the first fruit showing us perfectly how to run the race, how to keep on the perfect arrow path. We're reminded of that as we see the wide path revealed truth imposes a limitation. Look at even school, what gets taught all through the years that I remember, and even now it probably is it gets worse. Broaden your mind. Broaden your mind. Accept the new ideas. Bring in the things to broaden. Make your mind wide instead of digging into God's truth. We think of this reminder in our life and what we're to be living. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7, putting it in our heart, teaching it to our children, how much, again, God's laws are perfect, living them, striving them every step of our life. We see these two ways throughout the Bible, and we see perfectly described as the give way versus the get way. You see Cain versus Abel. You see life versus death. Psalm 1, we won't turn over there right now, but we see the way of righteousness versus the way of the wicked. You see the narrow way versus the wide. The way of the righteous delights in God's laws, bears fruits and prospers. The way of the wicked, driven like chaff before the wind and perish. You see this first of these two ways that are Matthew 7. The second, we see the two gates. Two ways. They have some form of a gate on each one. Kind of argue the wide is, seems like it's just wide open. to suit. Just come on in. There's no need to worry about anything. You see two gates, specifically the narrow and the wide again. The narrow, you have to look for it. Not easy to find and easy to miss. Ultimately, God the Father has to call you to open your mind to it. John 6, verse 44, a reminder of his calling in our life. Feel it. If people come in, oh, have I missed it all these years? Like, because God has to open the mind. Think of that reminder that God the Father calls and he leads us to repentance. 
Romans 2 verse, uh, Romans 2 verse 4 reminds us that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. You still have to repent. And I've seen many people come through the door, excited, oh, I and then, well, I have, Trinity's not true? Well, I don't, that's what I've been taught all my life. And you got to keep the Sabbath every week. And you see the struggle. Well, you know, I don't know. It's not going to be popular with my family. Uh, but you put first. Follow the wide. Well, that's where my family is. And that, they're popular. Well, they'll accept me if I go that way. Where does it lead? Think of God's calling in our life and the goodness of God leads you to repentance. You still have to repent. You have to, yes, I do have to repent. I am going the wrong direction. I've got to go God's way. And that reminder in our life, the wide gate, as we see, is simple to get on the easy road, open to all. No limit to luggage you take with you. It includes all your sins, you're going to take them all on the wide path. We think of leaving nothing behind. Self-righteousness, pride is a must. But your sins, baggage continues to go with you. The narrow way, you leave everything behind. You bury the old man. Think of baptism, the removal of our death penalty. Sins are forgiven, selfish ambition removed. Continually to strive to live by God's ways. Again, repent. Doesn't mean we're perfect. It means it's the times as Paul talks, you stumble. God, help me to overcome. I want to stay in your truth. I want to live by your ways always. You think of that reminder as we try to strive to live by every word of God. We see under the narrow gate of repentance, turning to God, the wide sin unrepented of. Live how you like. Big deal. The sin's not forgiven under the wide path or the wide gate. The narrow, Christ's forgiveness of our sins when we repent and turn to God. We think of that reminder as we think of the narrow gate. In some regards, it sounds like a single turnstile as you're entering, going one by one in. Think of that reminder. Enter one by one, like a turnpike gate. Going in, and it's like, oh, you're all alone, just you and God. That's it? Turn over to John chapter 10. Seen that, especially this past year, it can be difficult. You know, boy, it seemed a lot easier just to stay at home. I didn't have to worry about Fellowshipping with people, I didn't have to worry about so many things. It's just easy to stay home. Is that what God has called you to do? On chapter 10, verse 7 through 9, John 10, reminded of this narrow gate or this narrow door. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. He's not the door of the goats. He's the door of the sheep. All who enter came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. It's false messiahs, false Christ. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Find pasture to be with the other sheep. Build, encourage, help each other. That door, again, is Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ's sacrifice our sins can be a reminder of baptism that we can enter in to strive to live by every word of God. Christ, again, is that door, the only way to enter. And over to Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> Sometimes we can get this verse in our mind the wrong way. It is absolutely true, but I've seen people twist it. Philippians chapter 2, we're reminded of this mind that's to be in us. Jesus Christ showed us perfectly what that mind is like. What a mind to duplicate in our life, to live by. We get to verse 12, Philippians 2 verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, 
not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Heard this, you know, I, I don't really need church as long as I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. It's just me and God. Yes and no. Think of working out your own salvation. You don't, well, my, my faith through my husband or my wife, that's, I can get in the kingdom because of their commitment. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But it's not just you and God. You start looking at congregation, encouraging, helping, building up. How, how was the week? How are you doing? One of the hymns of that, how do you know that you're one of God's, Christ's disciples if you have love for one another? Christ continually emphasize of caring. How do you care for each other if we're just isolated? This many times through many years, people that want to be the independent Christians. Well, I just want to stay home. Some groups are great because all you got to do is webcast and you never have to see anybody. And it's just, just me and God, just me and God. That's not what we're called to be. We're to be dependent on, a, on each other, to help each other, to encourage, to build up that love and care and concern that must be there. We can read at the end of verse 12, but keep reading. Verse 13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. All by yourself, kind of hard to murmur and dispute. Think of building each other up or are we tearing each other down? Caring for each other that goes through children of God and the family. All to enter through that door, Jesus Christ, to a pasture. To care for each other as sheep, as fellow sheep. To look out for each other, dependent on one another. Again, the narrow way. We think of this third section as you turn back to Matthew. But think of these three. Uh, fourth one, uh, four of them, this is the third one. We look at two ways, two gates. We're also reminded there's two destinations. Two destinations. You have life, and you have destruction. Life and destruction. Think of prospering, perishing. Think of Deuteronomy 30 we looked at a few weeks ago. God sets before us life and good. He sets before us death and evil. Which do we choose? Turn over to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Jeremiah sums this up as well in chapter 21 and verse 8. Jeremiah 21, verse 8. Talking of Jerusalem's doom and them not turning back, and even the righteous reminded, well, listening, here is. What you need to remember, Jeremiah 21 and verse 8. Now you shall say to this people, thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. You see this specifically dealing with physical life as he says, well, here's how you can save physically and escape Jerusalem. And if you don't listen, here's the other way. See, as it again points to Deuteronomy 30, the bigger picture, I set before you life, I set before you death. Choose life. Choose it. Way of the blessings, what God has given. Think of this. I set before you life and death. I set before you blessing and cursing. Matthew's account of what we've been looking at in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, reminds us he sets before us life, eternal life. The other path, the other destination is listed as destruction, death. Leads us to the fourth of these, third one being the two destinations, and the fourth being there's two crowds. Two crowds. If you look at the narrow way, comparatively deserted. Those, there are few who find it. You that will walk that path to live it. The wide path, many. It's a busy thoroughfare, thronged by pedestrians of every kind. You can do whatever you want. 
multitudes on the broad road, popular, yet leads to destruction. Think of the first crowd, not many there. Minority, extremely unfashionable to be on the narrow path, not popular. Those that find it, find eternal life. They continue on that path and persevere to the very end. So we think of this section of Scripture in the Sermon on the Mount, and it goes through the reminder in the next few verses of being aware of false prophets, staying close to God, knowing what the narrow path, and as we heard in the sermon, you start hearing, well, you know, here's some new things. Oh, maybe that's, that's the wide path. Don't go down the wide path. Stay on God's way. Stay in his truth. Why, again, we're reminded it's listed here in Matthew's account. It's, why is it difficult when we see Christ saying, Joke to me, it's easy. Mind it, it's difficult because the world goes the opposite way. Satan's deception. Over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In Timothy 3. This deception and this reminder that is there in Timothy 3. <clears throat> Timothy, 2 Timothy. Well, we read earlier, but again, this emphasis yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Very similar to Matthew. Because then it goes, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I've seen this so many times. The deceptions are there, and then eventually they split again. And now they're deceiving themselves about something else, and it continually just goes to deception. You're not looking at God's truth. It's easy to be deceived. This instruction to a young pastor, Timothy, you have God's precious truth. Dig into it, learn from it, teach from it, live by it, put it into practice. You see this reminder, this difficulty that is there comes from a world that opposes it. Satan's deceptions are there. We also have the reminder that the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. How many times have we gone, ah, I'll, I never want to do that again. And, ah, God, I did it again. Help me to overcome. Help me get this out of my life. See that reminder that we're still flesh, flesh and blood, trying to live by God's perfect ways. We need God helping us every step of the way. As so we look at these four sets of twos, think of two ways. And the hard and the easy way. There's no middle way. Kind of easy in the middle way, the medium way. There's the easy and the hard. Two gates, the narrow and the broad. There's no other gate. The narrow or the broad. Two sets of crowds, the small crowd and the large crowd. There's no neutral group of us, well, kind of a medium-sized group. Still, the large, the two destinations, life and death, no third alternative, sets before us life and death. Look at both of these ways, the narrow way of God completely fulfills, the narrow way of God completely fulfills in every way. The broad way of Satan completely Empties. Seemed popular for a while. Boy, things are going great, but it still leads to destruction. Broadway of Satan completely empties. Turn over to Psalm chapter 1. <clears throat> I referenced this earlier, and I love this hymn. Sometimes it, well, you know, this is just kind of the basic hymn. It's number one. Yet we see. Both of these ways that Christ describes shows us this reminder in our life. What are we choosing? Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're not going to the wide path. Well, well, can I get some input from you? I see you're going the wrong way, but what do you think about? Why ask their input? Go to God's input. Let's learn from it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, and even in the path, the wide path. Nowhere near it, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The word meditates in the true meaning goes through the pondering by talking to himself. Think about how many times you think on a verse. I always, even if you don't have a lot of time in the morning, it's great to make good time for Bible study, but having some Bible study. And how many times you kind of think about the verses you read through the day. Yeah, that applied to this. Wow, that's awesome. And you think about it. Think of what's God's laws. God's laws are spit on in this world. Well, let's see what the world thinks. Well, what does the world think I should do here? Who cares what the world thinks? What is God's word? I dig into it. Let me think about it. Let me ponder it, meditate on it day and night. Verse 3, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit and its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Because he's living God's ways, putting it into practice. We see the other path, verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. See these two paths shown clearly. Psalm 1. This reminder of less than happy is the man, the narrow way. You see the wicked, it happens. Chaff like the wind flown away. Think of that destruction and what it leads to. Turn finally over to Psalm 112. Sabbath verse. Pastor's letter yesterday. So much in this chapter again reminds us of the same principle in Psalm 1. Psalm 112, we had verse 1 in there, but there's so much in this entire chapter. All of them do. Psalm 112, verse 1. <clears throat> Praise the church member who's been in the church for so many years. I like to misquote it. But it helps, all right, where does the praise go? God calls us out of this world. Thank you for coming out of this world. Help me to stay humble. Help me to know where the blessings are coming in my life. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. This fear, again, this awe, respect we're looking to in our life. Understanding his ways are perfect who delights greatly in his commandments. It's not, oh, you know, I kind of like them. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, they're nice. Who delights greatly in his commandments. So you see that understanding develop is you break one of them. and Oh, that did not feel good. Oh, there's the curse from it. Oh, I don't want that. I greatly desire God's laws. Perfect. They're righteous, their holiness. Verse 2, we see more of this. Blessed is this man. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Because it's not his righteousness. He's seeking first the kingdom of God, God's righteousness. That's why that righteousness stands or endures forever. Verse 4, unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. And 
Compassion is not just you and God. Caring and looking out for others. How, how can we help? Full of compassion. A, man, a good man deals graciously and leads and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He continues to endure to the end. Verse 9, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn, or strength, will be exalted with honor. I like this chapter because you only get one verse of the other side. See all the blessings from the narrow path. Verse 10, the wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Don't go down the wide path. There, yeah, turn back to God. Again, the blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Something we reflect on, think on, dig into. Again, are always in our mind, thinking what God wants us to do in our life. Is they're the perfect way. So we think of this weekend often associated with freedom. We have freedom. We are free to choose. God sets before us life and death. Choose life. The give way versus the get way. Choose giving. We have entered the narrow gate at baptism. Stay on the path God is leading us in. Again, there aren't many ways to God, many paths. There's one path, the narrow way. Stay on the path of God, which leads to eternal life. It takes work to continue on God's path. Others will distract and try to get you off that path. Know where the other path leads. Don't be led astray. Stay on the narrow. Delight greatly in God's commandments, and keep on his perfect, narrow 